Our next conversation is entitled Crafting the Do-It-Yourself Economy. It's going to, our moderator, Matt Iglesias, is Slate's business and economics correspondent. He actually has a uh, book that is coming out on March 6th, so this is the eve. Matt has written a book about the building I live in, I assume, because the title is The Rent is Too Damn High. So uh, I look forward to reading uh, Matt's book about my building. And I'm sure it's more about the macroeconomics of our housing situation in the US. Uh, we're uh, thrilled that Matt could join us. He's a terrific writer. Uh, he's been at Slate for a while now, and we've done uh, several events with Matt. Prior to that, um, he was at the Center for American Progress, and I'm sure many of you follow him in social media and have read his blog even prior to his being at Slate, where he continues to do great work. So Matt, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> I've got a little microphone here, right? Does this work? OK, excellent. Um, so this, uh, the, the, the title we've been given here is Crafting the Do-It-Yourself Economy. Uh, and I think you know, the, the theme uh, running through the panelists here is that you know, nothing in economic life can truly be done all by yourself. Uh, by definition, you, if, you're, if you're engaged in economic life, you're engaging with other people, with other customers, with other suppliers, uh, things like that. So the question is, is you know, how, how can we make that work? If, if you're making things, if you're doing it yourself, how can you connect with the other people uh, out there in the world who, who might need the services you have or who have the resources you need, and what are the implications of a sort of a reshaped world around uh, maker culture and, and do-it-yourself production? So with me uh, on, on the far right is uh, Cindy Aw, Community Director at Kickstarter, which is a sort of a great company in the, in the crowdfunding universe. Uh, then we have Bannon Garrett, who's Director of Asia Programs at the Atlantic Council and a recent co-author of a report on Could 3D Printing Change the World? And Chad Dickerson is CEO of Etsy, uh, which I'm sure is a company uh, everybody knows, a, a marketplace for um, mostly sort of craft-oriented vendors, uh, but, but other things as well. And um, you know, to, to kick things off, I figured we should, we should just sort of cut to the chase. Um, can 3D printing change the world? <laughs> It can if you sell your 3D printed items on Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I, 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 I just, I, I hate these reports with question, question marks in the title, you know? Yes, no? But do you want me to answer? Yeah. Because I, I, I'm not at the uh, 30,000 foot level, I'm at the <laughs> space station level All right. of this as a, as a non-techie. -tech, and, and then we're going we're gonna to go down, down the world. You know? I, 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 this is something that I only became really familiar with over a little over a year ago, working with some people from Virginia Tech, and we've been doing workshops at the Atlantic Council to try to bring together people doing technology and science with foreign policy people who generally know absolutely nothing about technology and the technology is going to shape the world that they are going to operate in. Uh, the people who had no clue about the internet and now find the internet totally uh, ubiquitous, per pervasive, and has changed their world dramatically. So the idea is looking down the world 10, 20 years, but what might change your world and that you better know about and understand and maybe marshal these technologies to do things you want to do. So looking at 3D printing, what you see from the macro level, if you really play it out, is it's a total transformation how we manufacture, you know, first time in a couple hundred years. And it brings, it does many things. First of all, it would bring manufacturing back, not just home, but to closer to the consumer that you produce where it's consumed, and you produce what you want when you want it. You don't even produce inventories. You produce the product that you want on demand for the product. And mostly what you're moving around the world then is not container ships full of goodies that are produced in one platform, but you're moving STL files around the world and producing the goods where they want, and, and you're moving raw materials for the printer cartridges basically, you know, whether it's titanium or it's uh, copper or it's, you know, plastics or ceramics. I mean, there's all kinds of materials being used now and they're going to go a lot farther in terms of what's possible. And of course, we talked about today, I think was so uh, interesting, was that, well, I think so exciting about 3D printing or additive manufacturing to use the more generic term for many different technologies here, is that you, anything you can design basically you can print. 
And every time, and there is absolutely no penalty for complexity. You make them, you saw some very complex items out there. It's no more difficult, no more costly to produce one of those, a ball within a ball within a ball, something that can't even be made by manufacturing traditional methods with machine tools. It's no more costly to do that than to make, to make a brick. In fact, probably cheaper because you use less material. And so, and then, and every time you print, you can print something different, unique. So there's one-off customized printing on a, and the same printer can be printing any number of products, right? So you could have a various size printers with different resolutions, different materials, but within the parameters of that printer and its resolution, you can print an unlimited number of products, and every time it prints, it's something different. It doesn't have to be the, the same thing. So this is a totally different uh, manufacturing uh, paradigm from you know, big supply chains, make all the little parts, they're shipped to a big factory in China, you know, Foxconn, and you have thousands of people on an assembly line making the same thing by assembling those parts. What if you eliminate the supply chains, you eliminate the platform, and you make the thing right where it's wanted and used, and it can be customized to the customer because there's no cost to doing that. So it, it really changes the whole geoeconomics of how we produce. I mean, think of the fact of maybe moving over, and we're talking over a 10, 20, 30 year period, not tomorrow, but to where more and more products are, or as I said, are manufactured where they're needed, when they're needed, there's no inventories, there's no excess production. Uh, by the way, with 3D printing, you don't, uh, you have a very, very resource efficient. Uh, I think Boeing is now making titanium landing gears. And in the past, 95% of the titanium is just thrown away and it's all mixed with chemicals. It becomes useless and very toxic and all that. Now there's virtually no waste. You use the titanium powder and you make what you want to make. Um, and this is true with all this. So if you think of a resource constrained world going forward and with another couple billion people on the planet and everybody wanting to be middle class, it's going to be very resource constrained. You're far more resource product productive, more efficient in use of resources, far to get the same output in terms of people's needs. And you're not moving goods all over the world in the same quantity, so your carbon footprint is greatly reduced. And uh, so in, in many, from the environmental perspective, there's huge benefits forward if you go to additive manufacturing. And from the uh, geopolitical perspective and geoeconomic, you're kinda, you could write the imbalances we see between exporters and importers. So you have a, a lot, and then uh, you know, many other you know, ap applications or implications that we have here for uh, education, for getting people involved, for <coughs> bottom-up economy. You have a problem of labor. Are you gonna be reducing and eliminating a lot of labor? That's probably true in some ways, but we're doing that already with the digital economy. That's where the jobs are not disappearing to China, they're disappearing to the digital economy. They're no longer needed. People are not doing things they used to do because they're done between machines, among machines. So that's a problem we're gonna have to face, but maybe it creates whole new sectors. And I think the final thing is we're gonna redesign what we make. Right now you're kind of making replacement parts. For example, in the F-18, they used to have a, a, an air duct system that's about 16 pieces that are all kind of mushed together metal that can, they can manufacture to do very complex airflows. And now they make one part that's designed to do exactly what it needs to do and no more. They're, the thicknesses, or whatever it is, it's, you only have what you need and nothing else. So they redesigned that part, but we're gonna start redesigning things themselves. The very end use item it might be, if you, if you don't start with what can, I, what can machine tools make for me and what do I design to the machine tools to have an outcome, but what, what's the product I want to do? And then I have no limits on the, on the way I might be able to design it. We're gonna have a whole new industries and new products. So there's a potential for the additive manufacturing and per, perhaps associated technologies to be to the material world, what the PC and the internet have been to the information world. And of course, the merging of the two is a big part of it. So, I mean, I don't want to go on and on here, but to say that it's simply there's a real potential for a very dramatic change in how we make things and, and with huge implications politically, geopolitically, economically, et cetera. So the short answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> Maybe, if we get our act together, right? See, that's, uh, it's concise. No, um, and, and, you know, of course, a certain kind of large-scale production has traditionally been driven in part by, by the literal needs of production, you know, how to put a line together, how to put a, a supply chain together, but also very much by the, by the demands of finance, that um, firms that have a certain size and a certain scale have um, advantages in being able to access bank lending, to access capital markets. Right. And right. so even where we've seen the ability technologically to move to sort of smaller, 
our institutions, it's not always possible to get the money you need to, to get things together. And as I understand it, at least, that's, that's very much what, what Kickstarter is, is supposed to be the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not the only answer. <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. I think that one of the really important things that we've seen emerge out of people using Kickstarter um, and working with a community to create something is that scale is now um, not an issue. It can be very, very small and something that you make for just 10 people, um, or it can be something you make for thousands of people. And I think that freedom to not be limited by scale is really important. Can you tell us a, a little bit about, about how, that, how does that work? I mean, how, how does it get you out of those limits? Sure. So, you know, when you launch a project on Kickstarter, um, you know, you set a funding goal, and if you reach that goal, you collect the money and you can make the thing that you're trying to make. Um, so if you're, you need $5,000 to make something and 10 people come up with that $5,000, then you're going to make as much as you can with that money for those people. Um, and as a reward, you give them back the thing that you made. And it's a very one-to-one um, -one relationship with the community that you're working with, very direct. Um, on the other hand, if the thing that you're trying to make ends up being something that lots of people want, which we've seen um, happen a uh, number of times, uh, all of a sudden the, the people that you're working with end up, that community ends up being thousands of people and all of a sudden you're ha you have thousands of one-to-one -one relationships. Um, and, and that is kind of you know, how that goes from being something that's compact and small uh, to also very large. Um, I think, uh, jump in here. Uh, I, I love Kickstarter. Kickstarter is awesome. <laughs> um, that actually the to talk about Etsy a little bit, Etsy is, as you said, is a marketplace. We have about 40 million visitors a month. And last year, sellers on Etsy uh, sold over 500 million uh, items, or five, $500 million in items of various kinds. And uh, I think like one of the coolest stories this actually connects to, to Kickstarter is this jacket I'm wearing. You usually think of Etsy if you're familiar with Etsy, and how many are familiar with Etsy? Great. A lot of times people think of Etsy as a craft site, and there are indeed a lot of crafts sold on Etsy, but the jacket I'm wearing and the shirt I'm wearing was actually made by a tailor who sells on Etsy. And one of the things that's really exciting, it's called Brooklyn Tailors. Um, Daniel and his wife Brenna started this company um, on Etsy and created the brand Brooklyn Tailors on Etsy. And they grew and they opened a brick and mortar store. And just recently, they launched um, a Kickstarter project to fund a fall line that they could create to actually pitch to retail stores. So I think when you look at that interplay between like Etsy and Kickstarter, you start to see that something like Brooklyn Taylor's, you know, two designers who had an idea suddenly have a really low barrier to start. And not only did, can they start on Etsy and start making money, they can also leverage Kickstarter to, um, to even, even grow their business even further. And we're actually starting to see new, er new ways to access capital at Etsy. So for example, um, there's a real gap between you know, the small business administration and the small entrepreneur on Etsy. And, and uh, just recently, a company called Capital Access Network was funded by Excel, which is a, a VC firm out on the West Coast, um, one of the investors in Facebook, one of the investors in Etsy. And there's another company called Cabbage, which starts with a K. And what both of these companies are doing are, are basically doing advanced loans to Etsy sellers, eBay sellers, and others. So I think. Um, there's just, we're in this really wonderful time where there, there's this wide array of sources for you to actually kind of live your life the way you want to live it. You know, I, I, I've been wanting to ask you about this, though. I mean, if, a, if a, someone starts out selling things on Etsy and it becomes successful, is this typically, I mean, is that a situation in which they're going to wind up outgrowing the platform? Or, I mean, how, how does it work as a, as a company? Presumably, yeah. you want the vendors to be successful, but too successful? Right, and I think, you know, Currently, you know, Etsy is a really, really great way to start a business. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we see people, what we call internally to Etsy, we see people graduate to other platforms. We see uh, you know, Daniel at Brooklyn Taylor's starting his own shop, um, his own physical shop in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, and we see them expanding. But we're working on some things to help, um, help Etsy sellers kind of throughout their whole life cycle. And uh, so, but. Again, they have things like Kickstarter. They have these other capital sources to, to build out once they've gotten started on Etsy. And now, and now Kickstarter, you know, I mean, in a traditional sort of fundraising model, you're, you're getting money. And then what you're promising uh, to your investors, well, they're investors, and you're promising to give them a profit, give them, give them money back. Um, and there's, uh, I, I guess, regulatory 
<coughs> barriers to, to doing that in, in this sort of crowd crowdfunding way? Is, is that the, the issue? Well, I mean, by design, we didn't want people to be supporting creative projects with the idea that they're putting money in because they want money back. Mm -hmm. um, we always thought it would be much more um, rewarding and interesting an experience to support something because you feel like it deserves to exist. Um, and that's why, you know, we have a lot of art projects, we have a lot of, you know, film is one of our, uh, it is our biggest category. And um, the amount of support that the film community has for creating a lot of films that may not be traditionally marketable, um, but you see them succeeding wildly on Kickstarter, I think that's a huge testament to the fact that people really are not actually that interested in what they can get in return monetarily. It really is about the fact that they uh, we're able to be a part of making this film come alive. And I think that's really amazing. It's, an, it's a nice feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a hard one to be able to just go out in the world and get. <laughs> right. right, 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 right. And, and you know, I mean, back to, to sort of the, the, the bigger picture, um, you know, uh, on this, what, what kinds of uh, costs are, are involved in, in setting up you know, 3, 3D manufacturing, not 3D manufacturing, but um, these, these printing operations for, for real commercial purposes. I mean, what, what have you seen in, in your research? Well, what I understand from the people who yeah. do the yeah. research here, at least uh, people from uh, Virginia Tech I work with who are really deeply into this, is you have kind of bottom up and top down going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have MakerBot and all the experiments, and then universities and people with more and more sophisticated and capable uh, machines. But then you also have Boeing and you know General Motors and uh, HP now has gone big time into 3D printing to make the printers, but you have the big company, EADS makes Airbus. Right. Uh, and I just flew on one last night. Um, so a little jet lag. But uh, in any case, uh, they're tr working on printing wings to airplanes. And apparently 3% of the 757 was printed and more and more probably the 787. So the big manufacturers are seeing it solves problems. They're going to make uh, products that they couldn't make or make them better, make them cheaper, but for sort of small numbers of very critical parts, like the F-18 air duct system. Mm -hmm. But so you have both going both directions. And I think you'll see the, the, the MakerBot experimenters going up the upscale. You know, they get more and more sophisticated. Uh, the printers will get cheaper but more capable, presumably. And uh, they'll make products that uh, start to, to, to sell and, and uh, be substitutions for things that are being made a different way now. I, th I think the way I would envision the process taking place is that you reach tipping points on any particular product or in an industry where the people who are printing the, the, the product actually make a better product in some way. It's either cheaper, it's designed in a way like that uh, air duct system you just can't make with machine tools. For whatever reason, if you're going to be competitive, you're going to have to use the same process. And that'll kick it in you know, maybe a particular industry or, like I said, or a product line. And you'll just start seeing this happen along the way. I mean, they're also printing human tissue. They're printing, working on printing organs, replacement organs for human beings with your own tissue so it won't be rejected. I mean, it's going in so many different areas. In fact, one of the things I think about additive manufacturing is that it's not a single technology like the telegraph which actually transformed the world, mm -hmm. you know, totally. In fact, that was the first time in history the world was connected in real-time Internet. It's just a more, uh, shall we say, sophisticated way of doing it. But it was one technology. It, additive manufacturing is going to be like, a, not electricity exactly, but something that sort of permeates the way people do all kinds of things. They're making medical devices, like I said, all kinds of, you know, human, your own heart could be printed, a new one. They take a you know get an exact design of yours from you know MRI or imaging and then make a new one that they can put in, in you know to 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 save your life. Uh, this is going on now. They're working. Wake Forest people are working on this. So you're going to see it in that field. You're going to see it in making airplanes. You're going to see it in the automotive industry. You're going to see it in all different places. And we'll all it's all additive manufacturing, but it's not like only one technology. So uh, it, how it will take place, I don't know. But I think you'll see bottom. A bottom up and top down will be going on in all kinds of fields. It'll be, it, it's a real, it's the, it'll unleash a kind of creativity perhaps we saw in the IT field. And so what, what, what does the, the Etsy economy look like? I mean, who, wh what's being sold? How big is it as a, as a sort of share of the lives of the typical vendors? Yeah, so um, what I'm actually noticing, and this is really exciting, like when you think about when you hear Obama talking about jobs and that sort of thing, uh, we were recently looking at some numbers at Etsy, and if you look at like the top employers um, in the United States, I think Walmart's number one, Kelly Temp Services is number two, 
and you look at Etsy, uh, we have 800,000 sellers. If you, if you counted us as an employer, we'd be the number three employer in the United States. Now, the math isn't exactly right because some of those 800,000 are international, but to kind of give you a, a sense of scale, I mean, what we're seeing is, again, like using an example like Brooklyn Taylor's, uh, Daniel, who runs that shop, is you know, people are seeing opportunities to, to build the life that they want to build. So we talk to people who make a little bit of money on Etsy, um, on the website, sell at craft fairs and offline venues and make a little bit of money. They make a little bit of money uh, on Airbnb. Um, and they basically piece their lives together. Um, and I think what we're, what we're headed towards in the economy, I really like what uh, Douglas Rushkoff has said. And um, I'll probably get it wrong if I try to explain his whole, his whole theory. But if you Google, um, are jobs obsolete in Rushkoff, you can, you can read his whole, his whole treatise on that. I think what we're seeing is like the whole idea of jobs doesn't really make that much sense anymore. Um, and unfortunately, from like a policy standpoint, we still have a lot of you know, new, new Deal era type um, uh, institutions in place. And you know, a lot of people are getting jobs purely to get health insurance, not because they want to have a job. Um, and so when you ask how the Etsy economy fits into all that, I think you know, Etsy and Kickstarter and, and uh, you know, all these other platforms, Airbnb, TaskRabbit, uh, you know, people with free time, even Mechanical Turk a long time ago, well, it's still going. It seems old in my mind. <laughs> but uh, those are just platforms that allow people to, to make a living but not have a job. And I think that's where the economy is headed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about that from, from, from your perspective? I think it's very similar with Kickstarter. You know, it, you know, everything on Kickstarter is project-based, you know, and the idea isn't to just launch one thing and then that's the only thing you ever do. The idea is that you can do many things and as many times as you want. Um, and I think that kind of reflects this overall shift where, you know, you don't have to graduate with that degree and then be locked into this career for the next 50 years until you retire and get a clock to put on the mantle. Um, and in fact, we already know now that the workforce is shifting to the point where people really are switching every two or three years, um, often to things that they don't want to do because of the health insurance issue. Um, but you know, with, with Kickstarter, we see a lot of people using the platform to pursue the side project. And with the kind of success that some people are able to achieve, that side project then becomes the main project. And I'm, I'm assuming Etsy has very similar stories um, in that respect. And I think this idea of the side project being your main project is such an amazing thing um, in this kind of new American dream sort of way. Mm -hmm. so. so, I mean, you were talking about, about jobs disappearing. And you said, you said not yeah. to China, but, but sort of uh, into the digital economy. And, and they're talking about really jobs. Jobs vanishing. You're talking about oh, creation. I it is a very interesting phenomenon. I would direct people to an article by Brian Arthur, who wrote uh, The Nature of Technology and Its Evolution. He's a brilliant economist. He wrote a piece for the McKinsey Quarterly in October on the second economy. And he sort of makes the point you move from agricultural economy, which had a huge, everybody was employed in, basically, and then you start an industrial economy. So people moved off the farm, but there were jobs for them as you got more productive in, in agriculture in the factories. And then you have robots more and more taking over factory jobs, but they're the service economy, so they can move into the service economy. And now you have the service economy, so many of the jobs are being replaced by the digital economy, the second economy, which he predicts to be as big as the real economy within 20 years. And uh, that means like if you go into an airport and you put your, your uh, credit card into the machine, it triggers 30 conversations with the TSA, with the airport in London where you're going to land, with the plane for the weight distribution. All these things that used to be handled by people talking to people are now just the machines talking to the machines. And this is going on in all kinds of fields. So those jobs are gone too. And those would have been, they didn't go to China. They went into the digital economy. So you're, you're, you're really transforming the economy. And if we get far more productive, so you have a surplus that you can now have people making things a whole different jobs that, that you guys are helping create that will employ people, uh, provide a, a living to them to sell to other people within the economy that won't be the traditional jobs because those are going to be gone. So we have to kind of reinvent what the job is, as you said. And, and, and then perhaps the you know, shop class and soul craft is, is a part of the, the answer that getting back to making things as part of how we do things in life. But the, the, the 3D printing particularly, that's going to lead to a lot of, uh, not necessarily the you know, the, the um, uh, 
factory jobs, you know, the, the, the uh, assembly line jobs, but all kinds of innovative uh, ways of doing things. And I, I think we'll, another economy is kind of growing up, and you guys are part of it, that's, that's uh, coming out of a place that nobody expected. And I think the economists are probably the last people to figure it out, because uh, they never see disruptive change, and they, you know, their mod models are all linear. But you guys are creating a, a whole different world. And it, if we're smart, we'll make a very successful one. Uh, but it's going to be very wrenching, and, trans and I think you're right, government is going to have to change what it does. I mean, it's obvious you need health care that's portable. That's, a, it, you know, I mean, our health care system couldn't, you know, if you, you couldn't possibly design a worse one from scratch uh, for how we deliver uh, health through health insurance, how we pay for it. I mean, it's just, it's mind-bogglingly stupid. And it, it, and it inhibits people. I mean, that's, you can't sell your house right now, and you can't change your job because you lose your health care. And you, know, you limit labor mobility, you limit all these job mobility and creativity. So we have to find a solution to that to make it much more viable for people to say, you know, chuck this job, I'm off going to make my own thing, and I can still have health care, I can still have a pension. You know, uh, this, is a, this is big challenges that are beyond. I mean, what you're doing needs to stimulate and push this public policy debate yeah. to someplace else. So we end up in a different place than neither party is really talking about right now, as I, as I understand it. Yeah, I mean, one, of, one of the most exciting uh, organizations to me around, and, and many of you may or may not have heard of it, is the Freelancers Union, which is um, based in New York. And what the Freelancers Union has done, they're uh, actually in the same neighborhood as Etsy, is they, you know, freelancers, I believe, are 30% uh, of the population. I think it's about 42 million people. And what they've done is they've created a group health care plan for freelancers. And if you look at that block as a group, it's like larger than like the teachers union and the you know, doctors unions and the AFL-CIO and all of those. And so it's really exciting to me to see an organization that's not, that's taking kind of an old construct, which is a union and not really representing sort of like labor against management because there is no management in that case. They're sort of going back to the original idea of a union which is to guild. provide a guild and provide benefits to workers. So I, I'm, I'm really excited. I think they're, they just got a grant to begin work. They're offering health care in New York. I think New Jersey's on the way and Oregon's on the way. And you know, if the Freelancers Union can do that, all of the reasons that you can't leave your job and you know, uh, they go away. And I think that's largely a policy yeah. issue. It's exciting. But, you know, I, I mean, at, at the same time, you know, we, we were talking about a sort of, you know, post-jobs post, post -jobs, uh, uh, lifestyle, um, but, but you guys all have jobs, yes. <laughs> and, I suppose we do. <laughs> and the, right, and, and, and the companies are, are full of people who, who have jobs, uh, engineers and, and salespeople and, and so forth, and, and I think maybe, um, I don't know, maybe they like it. Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't want to. I don't. We're no. I don't think anyone's trying to get rid of the concept of jobs altogether. Um, and in fact, you know, we've seen some really interesting uh, cases where uh, projects have been able to bring jobs back to certain areas. Um, so we had a really successful design project to uh, manufacture these um, phase change coffee, uh, they're called coffee julies. If I try to explain it scientifically, I'm going to screw it up. <laughs> but you know, it, it's this, this, you put it in your coffee and it brings it to the perfect temperature. Um, and they actually went to all over the US trying to find a factory that could manufacture these coffee bean shaped stainless steel units. And they had a really hard time. Um, they really wanted to, and you know, a lot of factories had shut down. And what ended up happening is that they found a factory in upstate New York that used to make silverware. And they had shut down because there weren't enough orders. And they were able to bring that factory back to life. And I just think that sort of story is so fascinating and so incredible because we talk about you know, all these manufacturing jobs leaving the US when, in fact, there are fully functioning factories here with skilled labor, skilled workers who know how to run these machines. And they just need something to make. And I, I love that example. This will be a little contradictory to saying jobs are going away. I mean, we're seeing the same thing with Etsy. We have a seller in Alabama who um, realized that there were a lot of women in her community who were seamstresses and uh, you know, the, the art was kind of going away, but now there's a huge market for you know, vintage and vintage inspired clothing. So she created a clothing line and now she employs the seamstresses um, in her community. So I, you're totally right. Like I think when you hear politicians talking about jobs being gone, they're looking at like old factories that are sitting sort of fallow and you know, General Motors and kind of very centralized manufacturing, but I think um, what we're talking about here is that 
manufacturing isn't going away, it's just decentralizing. And, uh, and I think you know, people are working in better conditions in that, in that regard too, I think. So on that note, uh, maybe, a, maybe a good moment to, to decentralize the, the question asking. Um, see uh, see what, what people have to say, uh, you there. Hello, I'm Elizabeth Merritt. I run the Center for the Future of Museums for the American Association of Museums, and I have a question for Cindy. Of course, museums have been in the business as nonprofits for 100 years of asking people for money and saying, we do cool stuff, give us money. So I've been talking to them about Kickstarter and saying, go and look at this, and they get freaked out. They say, wait a minute, you're telling me people are asking people for money to do cool things, and these are not nonprofits. They're just like people or for-profit businesses. How does this work? And it's a really good question. I mean, I've done it myself. I've given money. And yes, I got something in return, but what I got in return was in no way the equal of the value of what I gave, what I think of as donating. It was like getting the tote bag from PBS for making your pledge. I, I was wondering, has Kickstarter or anybody that you know done any research into this sort of philanthropic type psychology of people supporting projects that, you know, until there's regulatory reform, they're not real stakeholders in it. They're just doing, supporting something they think is good. Um, we haven't done any formal research. Uh, everything we kind of know about how people behave on site at this point has been largely anecdotal, just based on what we see. And we know that more and more people are participating in this. Um, more and more people are backing you know, different types of projects. So someone who loves film doesn't only back film projects. They sometimes go off and back a music project. And we think that a lot of that has to do with your networks and who you know. So the, usually when people back a project the first time, it might be because it's their friend or it's a relative. Um, and then you know, eventually down the line, it just ends up being it's an idea that they think is interesting. Um, so I, I don't have any you know, percentages or, or data to, to support you know, any concrete uh, statements at this point. Um, but I do think this idea that you, know, you can use your money in a way that isn't just buying something, that you can also make a statement with your purchase, whether that's a vote of confidence to a friend or a vote of confidence that you know, an important documentary about an issue you care about should be made, I think um, that is what we're seeing a lot in terms of how people are um, using the way they spend their money. But how does it work in, in legal terms? I mean, in, in, in terms of taxes, if I'm producing a movie, I'm raising money, um, you know, I don't have an incorporated nonprofit, uh, like what, what happens? Uh, Amazon Payments is our payments processor, and then you do get tax. It's taxable income, I think, above $20,000. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, we have the same problem at Etsy, um, or challenge. <laughs> right. The IRS gets into everything. Uh, <laughs> of course. Yeah, I mean, just this year, uh, we started our sellers above a certain level, $20,000, started getting 1099Ks. So as, as the platform, we had to educate sellers on what that meant because, you know, they, in many cases, were just doing something they loved and didn't expect to hear from the IRS. Right. But so there's a new, new, new jobs for accountants <laughs> yes. coming up, right? That's uh, <laughs> you there uh, in, the, in the purple yes. back there. Always for lawyers. Lawyers never go out of style. Uh, hi, I'm Susan Garfinkel. Um, and I was asked to, I tweeted this question a little while ago, and I was asked by the official tweeter uh, from the uh, NAF to ask now, although uh, it, my question probably applies more to the whole afternoon than specifically the session, except that it was about craft, and I think because we have the Etsy representative here, they asked me to ask it now. But what I was trying to think about was, and I come from a background of folklore, where people have studied craft for a long time and craft and making things with your hands before the technology or our current round of technology has, has been part of the mix. And so I've been trying to think about what's new about the maker movement as opposed to earlier or different kinds of craft. And, and my earlier question that I posted was about some of the gender differences and not necessarily that I think there is a an inherent gender difference between men doing making and women doing craft, let's say the rise of, of the revival of knitting through Ravelry or all the kinds of craft that we're seeing on Etsy. But I do think there is a cultural difference that's happening right now. And I was trying to think about what the underlying issues about the differences between making and craft were. And I one thought I had, and then I'd want to see if you have any thoughts, is about perhaps with making, um, the final product is not necessarily supposed to or idealized for being handmade and singular 
um, may be making is on the way to trying to come to a big concept and that in craft we still want that handmade small production final item. So that's just a question and I, the gendered yeah. aspect. I, mean, I, I, hope, I hope this isn't a disappointing answer. I mean, we don't, we don't actually consider, you know, the items sold on Etsy, we, we refer to them as handmade, but in our minds there's not a lot of distinction between craft and making and I think, like, in my opinion, I mean, Dale knows a lot about this um, from his studies of the, the, the maker movement. I think the internet has allowed people to communicate really quickly, whereas, um, you know, in the past, things are handed down from generation to de generation. You had to, you know, wait 80 years for your grandmother to get old and tell you something. <laughs> and now you can just download it on the internet. So yeah, I think... Your dumb old grandma. Right. <laughs> you know, someone... Someone took their 80-year-old grandmother's, uh, you know, advice on making, you know, pickles, and they've put it on a blog, and now that that is available to anyone. So, um, I think, you know, in some ways, uh, and this just sort of popped into my head now. I think, you know, the internet has allowed us to record this folklore, and, it's, and now it's searchable on Google. So, if I wanted to leave this, um, uh, leave this event, and learn how to make my own bourbon in my house, which sounds like a pretty good idea. Uh, I would just, I would be able to, I would know how to do that by the end of the night. Whereas I wouldn't have to grow up in Kentucky, have three generations before me, pass it down to each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the gender, on the gender issue, I think uh, we, we hear this a lot at Etsy and the majority of the, the sellers and the makers on Etsy are women. And the way I look at it is that we've created a platform that empowers women in a really unique way to start their own businesses. So I actually see that as a, as a really positive thing. Like the, seamstress, the seamstresses in Alabama could just as easily, you know, be in a call center like answering random calls, which is, uh, I think, a bit more dehumanizing than actually making a dress for someone. So I see it as, as uh, even though it's a return to tradition, I actually see it as more of empowering for women than anything else. Uh, so Jeff Howe, long-time fellow, Dumbo White, uh, long-time, uh, it's Etsy's Dumbo, um, uh, long-time member of Freelancers Union. So I both have written about the freelance economy and sort of exemplified it because I spent 20 years in New York as a freelancer. Right. Um, and I guess I just want to say that Freelancers Union rocks and like I wouldn't have been able to like give my, I don't know what we, how we would have given birth to our kids if we hadn't had Freelancers Union. But at the same time, I mean, uh, you know, the family plan's 1300 bucks. So, you know, yeah, a month. So I just want, you know, it, it's a workaround, like kind of a kludge to, you know, the yeah. emerging freelance economy, but it ain't a solution. I mean, no. until, you know, the larger systemic issues with healthcare costs are addressed, there are no solutions right now. And, you know, I, there's so many great ideas on this panel, and believe me, I, you know, we furnished our new house through Etsy. So, I mean, I love you guys, but, you know, I just want to throw that out that, like, we've got such a long way to go before we start, un like, being able to support the, the post-job economy. Well, you know, on, on the healthcare front, you know, is, is unusually... Uh vibrant in, in people's eyes, but, but this is in fact something we've had major legislation on recently. Um, but I wonder, I mean, are there, are there other aspects of public policy, uh, you know, that are, that are similar to that, but that haven't been even on the political agenda, where, you know, people um, find it hard to get by without sort of bigger institutions behind them? I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think we're still at a stage, like I've had conversations with, uh, with U.S. Senators about this sort of thing. And I think we're still at a stage where, like, the internet has been around for 20 years, but the, the people who are making policy and passing laws still don't understand it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. So, uh, um, I, you know, and, and, and to give an example, I won't, I won't mention any names. I was talking to a senator who um, didn't know, when I said Airbnb, he was, like, turned to his aide and said, what's, what's that? Right. Like, and I think, uh, you know, the, the, the knowledge just isn't there yet. So like, I, I less worry about specific policy implications and more generally about the lack of education in the political realm and like, how do we get that education in there and how do we get it in there quickly because there's just not an understanding. 
And, and I mean, what, what about the financial system? I mean, this is something that's very tied in, uh, you know, with, with the government, with the regulatory framework, um, something that, that you guys are deeply involved with, but, um, you know, only in a slightly idiosyncratic way. I mean, do, do we have the, the framework that we need? Um, honestly, I, I don't know if I can answer that question, you know? I mean, I know there's the legislation that Obama's been talking about, um, about crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and allowing um, investment online, which is specifically something that we don't do. Um, and, you know, like, I, I think it's an interesting conversation for people to consider as an option for small businesses. And it, I, I don't know if it'll be a solution um, but even the very idea that we're, that the government is thinking about technology in that way seems like a big step forward. Um, that there's enough understanding there that, okay, we could harness this um, in a kind of delocalized and, and yeah. So, right. All right. Hi, my name is Angelica Das. I'm at the Center for Social Media at American University. Um, and my community is um, social issue documentary filmmakers. And we're makers in every sense of the world. It's do it yourself, everything. So my question is how are these model how, how are these models um, sustainable when our end product is um, social change and social good? Um, you know, I've bought stuff from Etsy, I've run a Kickstarter campaign. Um, but, you know, I raise $5,000 to go out into the field and make a film, and then I come back and I still need another 50000 to finish it. And that's not even beginning to cover cost of living. Um, and, you know, ultimately, we're trying to figure out how, how all of these do-it-yourself methods and strategies um, can bring us into the market. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> it's too, that's too hard for me. The to me is that all is... The, tech, the cost of, the, of doing this has dropped precipitously. I mean, the, cost, the maker bought for $1,750, or the cost of doing digital video versus the old, you know, go back and film. I mean, you couldn't even think of making a film 30, 40 years ago, probably. So on the one hand, the, you have all these tools that, are, that bring the cost way down, and yet we can't find the funding to do it anyway. And, and there's something wrong with that picture, because we have the capability now to do what you couldn't have even dreamed of doing, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So I don't know the answer to it, but I think we have the potential is there to do these things at a very low, reasonable cost. So how do we pull that, pull that off? Yeah, and I don't think there's going to be one solution, you know. I think with, you know, at least with projects on Kickstarter, it often is working with a number of different sources, you know. So you're working with a nonprofit, and you're also working with funds that you raised yourself, and you've got private investors as well, and it's often all of these different sources that come together to make something happen. Um, and to think of any one source as being the single solution is generally not gonna, it's not gonna work because there's limited resources. Um, and I feel like that's kind of what's happening in the creative space, especially. Since I have a book coming out next week, I, I, can't, I can't resist plugging it. But, um, you know, I mean, one of the large sort of fixed cost elements in people's lives and a lot of people's businesses is the cost of real estate and a physical space. And this is an area where um, it's not that we haven't seen technological progress in building buildings, but there are lots of other kinds of limitations on the sort of the, the stock of, of physical space that people can inhabit. And when you have this sort of asymmetrical movements in costs, the, the remaining scarcities become uh, very problematic in, in people's lives. And, and that's healthcare, but I, but I think it's also, it's also housing. Um, I think probably got time for, for another, another question here. Um, yeah. My name is Alex Zhao. I'm a researcher for Bellwether Education Partners. What I've heard today is that what has driven the maker movement partially is that they, like various technologies have lowered the barriers to entry to gaining control over your own destiny, whether it's the, inform whether it's the internet for information or 3D printing for manufacturing, capital from Kickstarter, Etsy, finding a market. Um, I was wondering if there's a certain missing piece in terms of other barriers to entry to helping people gain control over their own destiny. I actually think one, one of the barriers is just sort of uh, people's attention. So when I think about the, the filmmaker back here, it's, you know, the more, uh, the more pieces of media that people are subjected to, the harder it is to get 
people to pay attention to your media. So, you know, I would say, you know, one of the biggest challenges if you're an Etsy seller, and we have many, many successful Etsy sellers, is, you know, marketing and, and uh, having people notice you versus all the other things in their lives. So uh, it's a long way of saying I think we're still, we're still in a world where, like, the one uh, resource that's not fungible is time. And so uh, I think that expresses itself in markets in terms of attention. Mm -hmm. Speaking of time, we are we are about out of it here. Well, I'm Karen Klein. I'm with Scrap DC, and this is too good of a booth not to let you know. Um, we've collected over three and a half tons of um, other people's cast off stuff, and we're open tomorrow at 52 O Street. We're open every Thursday. Um, we have all manner of crafty materials. And we'd love to have you in. Well, there you go. Time is scarce, and, and, and you have seized the moment. Um, well, thank you. Thank you to the panelists and, and for the great questions. <laughs> <laughs>